Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm super thrilled to be here with Loretta Chase and Susan Holloway Scott, who are the two nerdy girl, nerdy history girls. I was, and um, they have uh, reunited for this special program. So I'm really, really happy that they were willing to do this with us. Um, prior to me introducing them though, I just want to say a couple things. One is that um, We'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our adult programming or actually all of our programming. Um, we couldn't do it without them. We're also in partnership with the Medway Public Library for this program and we're really happy to do that because I feel like when libraries come together, we can do anything like bring the two nerdy history girls together. <laughs> and um, you can buy signed books from Loretta and Susan from Bank Square Books. I will put a link in the chat for that. and. Um, they are going to be signed. They can be signed by Bookplate, so make sure you check that out because signed books are gold. The great gifts too. Um, we are recording this session. We are also on Facebook Live, so um, you can ask questions in the Q and A here or on Facebook. Use the chat for comments and tech issues. I'll be paying attention to that. So, without further ado, I am going to get started because we have an hour to like pick their brains. <laughs> so I'm actually not going to do a whole big introduction because you guys are here. You know who, why you're here. Loretta Chase is a um, best-selling uh, romance author who has, who I, I will tell you that this book, which is backwards, has been, was on the top number one uh, place of all, uh, all about romances, top 100 books ever for the longest, longest time. And um, part of that is because of the deep historical dives you do, the research that makes it so real to life. And I, I, just, I just love this book so much. Um, Susan Holloway Scott is a writer of historical novels, 50? At least 50, right? 50, yeah. I also wrote historical romances too, so. Ooh, yeah. okay. Well, all of your books are on my Kindle, so I can't show them off. But <laughs> um, you all started the Two Nerdy History Girls blog. I know it went defunct a few years ago, but part of that was because you're so good at historical research. So I'm going to just start with how did you two meet? How did you two decide to do the blog? And how did you decide what you would talk about on the blog? Oh, boy. That's a lot. <laughs> there, there's a your lot. hour right there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to, who wants to start? Well, we, we met at a conference in Boston, a writers, a romance writers conference in Boston, and quickly discovered that we had all kinds of things in common, including our hair products. And um, so we, we just bonded right away. And we, what? Oh, and the birthdays. We have birthdays. Our birthdays. Uh, I'm June 1st. She's June 2nd. Yeah. So we were... Gemini's who are fated to be together. Yes, yes. <laughs> I also have to say you were holding up Lord of Scoundrels. That book was new when we first met and I had read it and I was a total fangirl. So I came up to Loretta and gushed a lot about that book. And that's how we first started talking was about that book. There you go. So um, how did you decide to start the Two Nerdy History Girls blog? We, well, we were in another blog, another writer's blog that had a whole bunch of writers and it was too crowded. And we decided that we wanted to do one that was just the two of us just writing about the things that we wanted to talk about. And if we were just doing it for each other, then we would be happy. But we found out there were a whole lot of other people who enjoyed it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really a surprise because we, really, we were expecting a very small audience, you know, nerdy history, but it just, <laughs> It just grew and grew. So that was a nice surprise. Yeah, I think it was at the peak time for blogging. You know, there's always things that come and go with social media. And we just happened to be doing something a lot of people want to read at the time when blogging was really hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're amazed at how often people, probably some of the people here today, will come up and say, we really wish you would keep on doing it. Oh, we wish you would come back. But it, yeah, we, it was we, a lot. It was a lot of work. It was yeah. a lot of work. Especially when you, when, when you have a tendency already to get bogged down with your own historical research and then to be doing the blog as well. 
it, it did get to be a little bit too much for us. I've noticed that both of you post very frequently about the research you're doing on Facebook at least. Um, so aren't you already doing the work? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do more on, I guess, on Instagram. And it's mostly, that's like, I think I mentioned this earlier. This It's it's sort of my relief from words. It's like, look at pictures. I was an art history major a long, long time ago. So I still really like paintings and art and everything. And that's what I put on my um, Instagram page. And then I've, of course I blab on about it because I blab on about everything, but that's not the same as writing blog posts. Blog posts are like little yeah. mini essays. Yeah, and it was a lot, a lot more work, especially at the beginning. We were doing them. We were doing much. seven days a week. Yeah, it was. <laughs> we were crazy. <laughs> yeah, we were crazy. Yes. <laughs> did you take yeah. turns or did you each do a blog post a day? No, no. Yeah. We alternated. Yes, I guess. Yeah. And then was... I remember I remember phone calls. Is it my turn to blog tomorrow? Is it or is it yours? Or yeah, th those kinds of things. And then we gradually um, reduced the number of blog posts we did per week. Okay. It, yeah, it was a lot. Seven days we, a week. We finally faded away. <laughs> <laughs> it was just too much work. It yeah. was really fun, but we were writing, working on the blog instead of working on our books. And that's, that's yeah. good. not a good thing. Yeah. yeah, as a reader, I'm opposed to that. <laughs> Since I want your books too. <laughs> I want it all. Um, okay, so let's start with your research. Um, I'm just going to go through the questions that I um, had written, and then we will take questions from our audience as well. In fact, remember to put your questions in the Q&A so I don't lose track of them. Um, I see a lot of really awesome comments about Mr. Impossible, and um, somebody said that they used, they, they archived all of your blog posts so that they still use them for their research, which I think is amazing, for reference. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, what was when you do historical research let's say what was the most surprising thing you've ever found um while do in your in your research for your books or life or whatever loretta okay um it's not a one thing it was a concept um the thing that surprised me the most was how many myths there were that we had uh bought into about uh, particularly fashion, because that's, you know, <laughs> love doing historical fashion. Um, and the judgments that were made about the way women dressed. So uh, very early on, and that was, I think that wasn't that, that was like, the, um, it might've been the first trip to Colonial Williamsburg with Susan that alerted me to uh, the myths say about uh, corsets and but, you know all these years I had assumed that women were miserable in their corsets and it was a terrible thing that they did to themselves and um, then we started talking to interpreters historical interpreters that were wearing these clothes every single day and found out um, no it's not like that. And probably some of the bras that you wear are more uncomfortable than the corsets that we're wearing. So um, I think the corset thing first opened my eyes to the way women's attire has been mocked through history. And usually it's the later generation makes fun of the earlier generation or doesn't understand it. Um, so it was like, it was an eye opener. Was like, oh, I always thought it was this, but it isn't that. It's much more complicated and interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to show that quick picture of the corset? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, let me just, if you guys hold on one second, I have not done this before. So uh, let's see. Doo, doo, doo. Let's see if that'll share the picture. Do you guys see it? There you go. Yes. There's there Janae. You go. <laughs> There's Janae. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop my share now. If you want, that was a that was in Williamsburg. You said, right? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, I mean, you could see that it's it's this very silky material. Um, the only really stiff thing in it is the busk that keeps you 
you know, standing straight in front. And also they like to have their breasts separated, not squished together. Um, but the rest of it is this beautiful quilted material. And when it you uh, lace it up the back, there's only so much, you can only pull it so hard or you're gonna uh, destroy the holes because they didn't have, um, Susan, what's the word? I, metal what, grommets. Grommets, they didn't have yeah. metal grommets. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a whole myth that got busted. No, you didn't lace up so you couldn't breathe. It was, it couldn't be done that way. So what was the purpose? Just to hold your boobs up? To, well, to keep you straight so that your clothes fit correctly. But posture was the big thing, right, Susan? Yeah, I mean, that's it's, the whole, you'd have a certain, a certain posture that showed that you were well-bred and at ease with yourself and your clothes would fit really well. It wasn't to make you, well, we're talking about two different time periods, really. Yes. Loretta's time period, and I'm, I'm earlier in the 18th century, but it's still kind of the same thing, is that they wanted a smooth silhouette rather than, they're not doing tight lacing. They're not trying to get that little Scarlett O'Hara waist that they can do later on. Because as Loretta said, the eyelets at this point that you're lacing things through are just worked with buttonhole stitch. And if you pull them too tight, they're gonna rip. So there was a limit to how, mm -hmm. how tightly you could you could compress yourself. And that wasn't the goal at that point. But it's interesting because somebody says, Scarlett's 19 inch waist was a myth. Ha! <laughs> no, I don't, I think that later on they really do get them that smaller. But by that point, the 1860s, they have, um, metal corsets, uh, the bones, and they have metal eyelets, and they can really squeeze you in. If but not that much. I, I, we, uh, I attended a, uh, a lecture about this, and uh, there are a couple of things going on there. Yes, there were a few people who did very tight lacing, was but that wasn't, yeah. was not common. No. And uh, the other thing is that they, there were, there were a lot of optical illusions. So you look at them from the front and the waist looks very tiny, but you look at them from the side. And They're it's, squished side to side, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, also, and this was on a YouTube video and I can't remember the, the YouTuber's name because she's like, she's so excellent. But she took a, a lot of very famous pictures of these people with their tiny waists. And she showed how they were um, painted over and inked in early version of Photoshop to make the waist look tinier than they were. Well, so there's also more optical these. illusion in like in Loretta's time period where everybody's got huge sleeves and huge skirts, which by comparison then makes your, your waist look smaller. That's so, amazing yeah. to me that even back then they knew how to play with the eye. Yes. So oh, I think as long as there's been fashion, people have been doing things like that. <laughs> the, yeah. the tricks just change, but the goals <laughs> are the same. Can you imagine the cave women? <laughs> I'm sure they did something. I'm I don't know, but no. I'm sure they did something. So Susan, what's been the most surprising thing that you've learned? Um, I guess more when when I'm going to write a historical novel, I tend to base it on one person telling their story so i'm always on the hunt for who that person will be and i never know where it's going to turn up um when i wrote about um eliza hamilton i wanted to write about her long before lynn manuel did and in fact if you go back in the two nerdy history girls there's a blog post about um, eliza hamilton that's way way back but i couldn't get at that point i couldn't get anybody interested in her even though i thought everything i read about her it sounded fascinating no one was interested until after the play came out and then then, then people were also interested. But um, in uh, the book after that, um, The Secret Wife of Aaron Burr, that whole book came from when I was researching on the Eliza Hamilton book and they were talking about Aaron Burr, obviously, as a bad man. And one of the, just in one place, one sentence, I saw that he had um, uh, two children with an Indian housekeeper that um, um, and that he married her, and there was just that one thing that was it, and that I couldn't, you know, that just stayed in my head for years and years, and then that became the next book because that was just such a, you know, for colonial America, this is this great shocking thing. So, so I guess that would probably be it when you go and find something that then you could just grows into an entire book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. 
actually somebody asks here, can you think of an example where a topic you researched for one reason ended up inspiring a later book or plot point? Oh, excuse me, my husband just sneezed really loud. <laughs> <laughs> they do that. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> It's kind of hard to say because things yeah. just turn, you know, they turn up and everything goes in your brain. It's like a giant dumpster of stuff. And you never really know what's going to come when you'll suddenly draw from that. It'll come up and you just sort of you incorporate it. It's the one thing that you needed to know, like how that window opened or how far the floor was from this. I mean, you know, just weird little things or like the clothes. And you yeah. just sort of you never know what's going to help you out later on mm -hmm. I, I know one thing i i realized after the fact i had uh during the time like i had a, a hiatus where i stopped writing and then I, t I tried to write a horror novel and i wanted to use egyptian mythology in it so i did an incredible amount of research and only years later after i had written mr impossible did i realize that that all that research was the inspiration for the way I told the story. So sometimes you're, it doesn't happen right away. It happens, it could happen years later, five years later. Yeah, you just, you just don't know when they're gonna yeah. bubble up. Right. So I'm curious about how you said it's sort of in your brain, but like, do you take extensive notes when you're researching and go back to them? How you do it? Uh, one of the things that for me, I have to do, I'll do sort of basic research when I know what I'm going to write about. And then I do, will sort of make a framework of the, the basic history at the time. And then I kind of research as I go along what I need for that chapter, because otherwise I just go crazy and I would never write. I would just keep always, there's always one more thing I can look up, but I tend to, I'll just keep going and adding things and sort of building the historical facts and historical details and stuff as a go rather than doing it all ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, which I guess is one of the luxuries of writing fiction as opposed to writing <laughs> writing a research book <laughs> or a nonfiction book. I don't have to worry about footnotes and things like that. So I can do it. I don't have to do it in a linear fashion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, but it sounds to me like you have a tendency, both of you, <laughs> to go down rabbit holes. Yes. So, I'm really curious about like, what's the worst rabbit hole you got caught in and how did you get out of it? I don't, th I think we're still there now. <laughs> I don't think we ever get out of it. <laughs> I'm always in a rabbit hole. Because <laughs> really like, well, things like the historical fashion is, is a classic example because that's such a rabbit hole. I don't ever need to learn anything else as far as how my, my people are dressed. I know what there are, but I'm always learning more and always trying to, you know, go to museums and collections and talk to people and learn more just because it interests me. So I think that if it's if it's something you're interested in, even if it's you can't find a way to justify it in the book, you'll still go look. Yeah, I was like the other day, Susan called my attention to an image from an 18. It was an 1830s couple of I mean, women, I guess, and they had and their dresses had a ruffle thing that I had never seen before. And so I Yesterday, I spent an hour just looking at images for that year to see if I could find out if it was a thing, that, mm -hmm. that ruffle thing. I, I'm not going to use it for anything, but I couldn't help myself. I had to find and out. And we probably talked about it for the better part of an hour. You know, what, yes. does, what does it yeah. look like? Why is it stripes? Here's something else like that. Right. But it's not going to be in any of our books. We just thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> As somebody says, the, the ruffle, a ruffle rattle. rattle. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. I was and actually going to say, in our audience, we have a lot of people that have some sort of historical uh, research background. Like somebody, um, I didn't catch her name. I'll go back a little bit. Is a knitwear designer and use one of your blog posts to create a knitting pattern. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Well, it too. So whoever, <laughs> uh, whoever it was. Elizabeth, yeah. So I think, I mean, like, I think that your blogs, even though that it's, it's defunct, has, has had such a, uh, an impact on people. It's just amazing when I, when I'm reading through the chat and like how. Well, we did, how we, it's still up too. We did not take it down. So right. as long as, as Google keeps blogger alive, it's still there. 
So. Well, Google's going to be around forever. So I think that you're okay. <laughs> so are we. we hope. <laughs> um, so let's dig in a little bit on your actual research. When you are starting a research project for a book, let's say, um, where do you go? How do you start? What resources do you use? You want me to I start? start? Just, who's going to start? Oh, Loretta, Please go start. ahead. Yeah. No, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> No, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, well, as I said, first I will do sort of a look, I'll read secondary sources, whatever, to come up with my frame, the framework sort of for what my story will be and what I need to look at. And then I really like to use primary sources. Um, I especially like to go to um, historical societies, uh, rare book rooms, libraries to see as much like original letters, um, documents as, as I can, because I feel it isn't just the, do you want to read the words and the contents? I really like seeing, I'm sure other people who are here tonight will feel the same way. You feel a real connection when you're actually holding the piece of paper that your character has written on. Um, I have been fortunate that these most recent books have all been set in, you know, within a day's trip of where I live. So I can go visit a lot of them too, it's surviving places. So that's been I'd like to do that too, to get sort of pick up the vibe of where my characters would have lived. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's probably the primary things. Okay. I think my thing lately has been uh, women's magazines. I, they're just fascinating to me. And my, but when I was, uh, I noticed that in, in deciding how where to set a book or what's going to go on in the book, it's a, a lot of it's determined by how how much easy access I have to something. Mm -hmm. So I I ended up writing the dressmaker series in 1835, mainly because I had access to a lot of material then, including this wonderful wonderful magazine that's not easily available online, but there are two editions, 1835 and 1833. So that kind of determined what, you know, to set the, the story. Okay, I'm gonna do 1835 because I can get some real information here, you know, about real people and actual things that were going on. And I love using something that actually happened and making my little scene happen within it. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's it, when you come across something that's like a historical scene, that's, you know, all great big grand people, but then you have to have your character's interpretation and what their part of it is. If it's some great um, parade or something that everybody's talking about, but how do your characters respond or uh, what did they wear or was it too crowded and their best dress got dirty? I mean, you, know, you have to think of all the little things that make it real tied in with a, a, a a fa uh, historical fact. Mm -hmm. um, is it a bit of a chicken and the egg type of thing with um, with your research in your books? Is that, like you just said, Loretta, uh, the Dressmaker series came along because you found these magazines. Well, um, actually it came along because my agent suggested I write a book about dressmakers. <laughs> <laughs> and the she, secret's out now. <laughs> she has, no, she just comes up with a great idea. She knows how to trigger things in my brain I don't she I don't know how she does it but she she just I guess it was because we were doing two nerdy history girls at the time and she was noticing there was a lot of fashion stuff and then she's she suggested it, and I just jumped on it I was so happy to do that so so I just wanted to correct that that wasn't but the year that I wrote it was determined by the magazine access to the magazine <laughs> You know, Loretta, my agent too had said, cause she also would read the blog and she said, you know, you're doing all this fashion stuff. Why don't you write about dressmakers or couture or something? I said, no, Loretta's already doing that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so they think alike. Yeah. <laughs> Your agent just got there first. <laughs> yeah. But I, well, I, I'm I mean, glad cause it was fun. It, yeah. And you did a really great job with them too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It just seemed though that like, I mean, you could, anybody could, you know, so many, there's so many aspects that can be written about that you could write two totally different series or books based yeah. on where your research leads you. You could have, and we would have been different time periods and stuff, but I just, well, I'll let Loretta have that one. Yeah, you, well, you don't want to, yeah, I, I don't want, I wouldn't want to be stepping on Susan's 
area. You know, she's she's doing. I would, I would like, hey, there's plenty of other stuff for me to do. Let her do her thing and let her yeah, do. No, it that's that's how I felt. Glory. With, yeah. yeah. So Angela says that she loves Dane, how Dane is always insulting Jess's hairdos and outfits and Lord of Scoundrels. And then she's like, all right, well, I won't tell you about the red lingerie. So <laughs> it definitely comes up in conversation. <laughs> and of course we all love Lord of Scoundrels. So that's what's going on right now in the chat. Um, so what, um, da, 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 da. Are you guys fans of the Georgette Heyer novels, Elizabeth's asking, because she is so much into the detailed descriptions of period dress. Um, I think Georgette did, Georgette Heyer did um, amazing things with her research and um, sort of, you know, she set the stage for the rest of us. But I, I don't think, you can really get away easily with writing books the way she did then. I mean, and that's true for so many genres. Um, when I when I put in the, the fashion descriptions in the books, I try not to make it gratuitous. I try to, for instance, Dane. You usually see her um, Jessica's clothing through his eyes, his interpretation of what she's wearing. So I use that to tell you something about the character. Um, I've always said that you shouldn't talk about, uh, you shouldn't do descriptions unless it's part of the action. And um, so I think where uh, Georgette was able to spend some just beautiful time talking about the details of the dress, I'm not sure that would go over as well now. I can enjoy it, but I'm not sure every, reader would at this point they they're ver they're very much i know they're set in the regency era but they're very much 1920s 30s in the time in which she wrote them and we can never escape our own time i mean no matter how much we think right. oh we've really researched it just right but we're not we're just reflecting that particular time period through our own time period and i think her books feel that way in a lot of ways that they, they tell you her characters would be at home with lord peter whimsy as well as they would with, um, uh, you know, the Prince Regent. Mm -hmm. And I think and that's going to be true of, of my stuff. You yeah, know, it's, it's, it's always the way. And even sometimes books in the course of the time that we've written, <laughs> the, you know, styles have changed and the, the kinds of things that people will like, want to read, are interested in how women are, are and relationships are portrayed has changed. So it, it's evolving all the time. Mm -hmm. But Loretta's right about that, not wanting to do that sort of red carpet description where you head to toe, tell what everybody's wearing because it just stops your action. Um, it just stops everything cold. Um, and it's fun from a research point of view to list everything in exactly the way that a fashion magazine would have at the time, because we, we really get off on that kind of stuff. But <laughs> readers, readers don't care. So you have to kind of, um, describe the clothes in the way that how the character feels or what they make them, um, how it helps describe them, how their the clothes reflect them or are sort of part of their characters. Um, the book I've just finished is on uh, Martha Washington. And most people think of Martha Washington as the older Martha with the big white hair and the big, I shouldn't say that with my hair, but um, with the big hat and just sort of looking kind of, you know, prunish. But when Martha was young, she was incredibly stylish. Um, when she was, she was a teenage bride, she married a, a very wealthy older man who loved to buy her expensive clothes from London. So that she was wearing, uh, you know, purple satin and sequin shoes and all this jewelry and everything. She was a very stylish, fashionable person. So as you have, I could make her make the young Martha through her clothes be very much a young, stylish, fashionista, wealthy young woman. And then as she goes through life, through the revolution, um, that's not, that's not going to cut it. If you're trying to show that you don't want to be part of the aristocracy and you're starting a new world and stuff. So she makes a conscious decision to wear more subdued clothes and what they call is homespun, but she's wearing um, still stylish things, but much more, um, as I said, subdued to sort of show we're all in this together. This is, you know, she's making a patriotic statement in her clothes 
rather than just listing everything that you wore. Mm -hmm. Um, Eden has a really good question. Um, she starts off with saying, thank you so much for helping me with a starting point for family research, Louisa Wolford. <laughs> but my question to you oh. both <laughs> is how do you decide what events in history your characters are going to partake in? Well, Susan's a totally different situation. Yeah, so we'll do two. You can, we'll talk about, them. do you want to go first? Yeah, you no, you, go? you go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Well, part of it is I have to figure out if they would actually be there. Um, if I'm writing, um, uh, the last few books have been had parts of them in, during the American Revolution. And obviously the war scenes, the women are not necessarily going to be there. They're not going to be witnessing it. So you have to sort of pick out the parts, pick out scenes where the your characters would plausibly be there as witnesses. Um, so that kind of reflects it. and often just going through their life, figuring out what would be a dramatic scene, what would be an important scene towards moving their life story along. Um, it's kind of, it kind of dictates, you know, and if there isn't a scene, because with a lot of women, they, you don't know what they thought or where they were or anything, you could sort of make, you know, invent something that's plausible or put them someplace that makes, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, you, you feel, that's why I say you have a historical framework and then I have to figure out where my characters are going to go cruising through. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I love about having uh, the court journal, for instance, because it will list all the events, the, the aristocratic events that happened in the course of the week. And um, depending on what the description is, I might get an idea for a scene. And this happened in uh, 10 Things I Hate About the Duke. I had read about this fancy fair that took place and it was a mob scene and they were talking about it was so crowded and women were fainting and they had to close the doors. And I, I could just picture my characters in that scene. Mm -hmm. So that's what I went with. And very often it's that you, you're, and that's one of the reasons I just love to flip through the magazines. I mean, it is, it is a time sink and it's a wonderful rat rat hole to uh, go down rabbit hole but um i will come upon an event and there'll be some little thing that triggers an idea for a scene and then it just blossoms the same mm -hmm. thing happened with this uh the uh the arena you know the chelsea arena um i a librarian in london told me about this person i had never heard of the Baron de Beranger. And I started researching him and he was such an interesting character. I found out he built this stadium in Chelsea that later became Cremorne Gardens. But for a sh brief shining moment, it was this place where people would go and practice uh, shooting and they would practice archery. It was this he made this really interesting place. I was like, I have to set a scene there. Mm -hmm. And it just all comes to life for you. Wow. Yeah. It, is, it <laughs> is true that like there'll be sometimes just the smallest thing, but then it can also turn into, as you say, the biggest rabbit hole yeah. time sink. One of the things that I'll get carried away with is weather. Because weather does, <laughs> especially in the past, weather affects how you travel, what, you know, the weather determined a lot more than it does now, but it doesn't necessarily have to determine as much as I will want to make it where I start <laughs> looking up, trying to find exactly what was the weather on July 15th, oh, I, you know, yeah, 1780. I, yeah. and, and I start looking up, I, I, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson kept weather and planting diaries. So you can go and look it all up and then you can look through the as Loretta says, through newspapers, and they'll talk about a terrible hailstorm on this date. And yeah, we, we get carried away. Whole morning's <laughs> writing is just out the window. Yeah. <laughs> well, that brings me to my next question about, um, obviously, you know, where do you find these resources, the newspapers, the magazines, the, the books? Um, where do you go to find these things? A lot of things are online now. Mm -hmm. Um, cause when we first started writing back in the middle ages, um, there weren't, and you were still doing things like going to the, get those, the, what was it? The pure, uh, the 
book of periodicals, those little green yes. journals. Yeah. What were they? What were they called? Something. I don't know. Index, but you had to look at periodicals. Out, yeah, and request things through interlibrary loan, and it would just take forever to to do stuff. And now you could just do a Google search, and there it is. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more um, uh, things are being put online. More and more institutions are putting their, all their holdings online all the time. So it's it's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. For me, probably one of the primary things I use is something called Founders Online that has all the, um, it's, I think it's through the library, I say Library of Congress, and someone's going to challenge me on that because I'm pretty sure that's who it is. But they have all the, almost all of the letters of all of uh, the founders online, and there are thousands and thousands of them, and it just makes life so much easier when you're trying to research. But you have to be a member to access their, um, no? No, um, I might be in the. Oh, it's a credit union. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking it up as we talk. No, it's, I think it's just it's a founders online. Yep, I found it. Okay, I'll put and it the, in. The, it's great. It in yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. And the uh, Boston Public Library has yeah, somebody uh, just put a. Oh, that you put it up. I said, oh look, somebody just supplied <laughs> the thing, and it's your, you. <laughs> Librarian. <laughs> well, I knew you would know. <laughs> I'm sorry. So Boston Public Library. Yeah, I, I have an e-card and I, it gives me access to the newspapers so yeah. I can look up the the uh, London, the Times of London from whatever year or day I want. Um, and I've also found that e uh, uh, this court journal drove me crazy because the timing of the, this book that I'm trying to write that I'm fighting with right now. Uh, I ended up having to set stuff in 1832 and I don't have an 1832 court journal, but again, we got in touch with the Yale library through interlibrary loan and I was able to get the material I wanted. So um, libraries still very much a part of it, even though we have access to tons mm -hmm. of stuff online. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yes. Well, that's when amazing. my, um, Go ahead. When, okay. When my children were in college, it was sort of like, good, I can use your, your number. I can use all your access through your name. And, you know, going through, it was like, you guys can't graduate. And my daughter went to graduate. <laughs> it was like, great. I can keep using all your library access. So yes, libraries yeah. continue to be important. Yeah. It's interesting because um, one time I was doing some research for one of my uh, library science classes and I needed a, a chapter from a book and it was only at one library and they would not give me access. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to me that they would let authors have access. Well, they places. dumped all of them, not all of them. All right, let's some not name any names because I'm gonna name it. some names, but um, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do it. But yeah, so would you, you have run into that too where you haven't been able to? Yeah, I mean, you know it's it. there and it's maddening because I know it's like, in a, it, I live outside of Philadelphia and it's in an, institution in Philadelphia and I know it's there and there's only three in the world and one of them is within 25 miles of where I live and I can't get it so yeah but some people are very helpful when you're authors and other times it's like oh you write yeah. fiction yeah <laughs> okay. no. So no no free pass there I guess no. <laughs> no. Um, no so the next part of that question about research is really about the travel, because I know you guys travel together to do some research. And I remember this story, the first time I met Loretta, she said this story about how she was in England and she was checking out a place for a scene and there just happened to be a mock duel going on at the time. And I thought that was amazing. <laughs> so I'm wondering how does your, now obviously we can't travel, you know, that much in the last couple of years, but like when you did travel, how did, how did that inform your writing? in terms of the research that you did when you were out and about? Oh my God, Lord of Scoundrels came out of a trip to um, Devon and, and Dartmoor. We spent a time on Dartmoor and it, it was just uh, the whole environment. Got my, I, whatever, the brain very excited. And I came home and I, I wrote this story. It was amazing writing experience, but it came out of actually being on the spot and uh, in that environment, what kind of person would fit? What kind of hero would come out of that environment? 
and a little bit was fed into the, the concept, those concepts of the Moors uh, from, you know, the Bronte sisters and that sort of romantic image, but sort of turning it on its head. But absolutely, the, the uh, being in places makes a huge difference. You see things that there's, there's no way you could, that can be captured in a book. And it's one of the reasons I return again and again to Colonial Williamsburg, because even though that's not my time period, the environment there, it's, it's like the carriages, horses, people on horseback, uh, people living in a, a completely different world than I'm living in. And also the interpreters just know everything. So I can ask them any kind of stupid question and they usually can steer me in the right direction, mm -hmm. but you're That's on the spot. Yeah. yeah. Loretta and I both, we both love Williamsburg because not only are the people, the interpreters very skilled at working with, you know, with addressing the public, but they're all amateur. They're nerdy history people too. <laughs> and they often just have so much knowledge and so they've done so much research that if you're asking them, they'll just, you know, ask questions, they always know, are willing to take you the next step deeper. And they're great. And that is my time period. So definitely, yeah. you know, that's, that's an out of the library um, kind of research. But Loretta's yeah. right is if you can visit a place that your characters knew, it makes all the difference. And it isn't just like, oh, look, the walls are yellow, but you start seeing things like how the light comes in, how the room, the, how this room is really big, how the furniture is very, would have been very, uh, expensive and costly and your character say is not that familiar with that world and how impressed they would be um how close it is to a road or if you look out this window you would see the river i mean there's just a whole lot of things that are not necessarily you look at a photograph and it's not there but yeah. if you can actually go there and walk up and down the stairs and realize that everything echoed there or um it you could you can smell the river from where you are i mean there's just all these little other yes. senses that you mm -hmm. can pick up. It was like that day when we, we rode in the carriage and uh, Napoleon was riding alongside us. <laughs> Mark Schneider. <laughs> Mark Schneider. He was so wonderful because I wanted to know if you're riding in a carriage, how hard or easy is it to carry on a conversation with someone who's riding alongside on a horse? And we mm -hmm. found out, well, it's really easy. I would never would have known that if I, if we hadn't done that. And also just being in the carriage and having a sense of the pace of things and what it felt like. Uh, yeah, just, be, and of course, we, we also got to see how the carriages were put together and the way that the panels worked. And uh, we got to see, I had never really understood what a postillion did until we were riding in that one where the, the our coachman, our coachwoman, was riding postillion and I could see exactly what she was doing and how the and how it worked. Mm -hmm. Until that time, I had no idea. Really. Just I had a vague a sense because you see pictures, but once you're in the carriage, it's a whole different, different thing. Yeah. One of the other myth busting kinds of things too is that when people look at clothes, 18th century clothes, and they think, um, oh, it took them so long to get dressed. It must have taken them forever. And when you're around the people in CW for whom that's their clothes, that they wear that every day. And when they're changing into their clothes and they're a little late and it's almost nine and you see them helping each other get dressed and they get dressed really fast. It's not this great arduous ritual. And I'm sure if you were a courtier at, at the French court, you probably did take a lot longer time, but everyday people get dressed pretty fast, just as fast as we do. Um, the same thing with putting up the hair. You read things where people go on about, oh, the hair took them hours and hours to do. And it's like, no, it doesn't. They, you know, if you had two sisters or if you had a maid, you got it done real fast. You can do it <laughs> yourself and put the cap on and you're ready to go. And there's none of that, you know, the history myths about their hair full of maggots and they never took their hair down and all that. It's like, no, <laughs> no, not true. <laughs> not true. Not no. true. And it, it's, it's, those are things that we learned by being there and talking mm -hmm. to the interpreters. So um, Audrey asks, do you find it weird to be writing in detail about historical London when you live so far away? No, 
No, it's escapist. <laughs> yeah, I guess well, in 1830s London doesn't exist anymore. Right. It's a time travel. I mean, no, it's not weird at all. It's wonderful. Um, it's where I want to be, but not really. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't want to be there in real life. As Susan and I have talked about this before, if we could be there like in a bubble, a protective bubble, but not to be there in real life. But um, no, that's not. It's not weird at all. It's uh, it's time travel. I love yeah. it. It's really fun. I mean, that's when it's, yes, it's really hard work what we do and it drives us nuts and all this stuff, but it's a really fun job because you get to, you really get to go back and es yeah. you know, escape. You get to li live these other lives from the, the safety of your own home. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, actually that brings up something that I saw, maybe it was a couple of years ago, Loretta, um, you and Carolyn were sharing a book called like Dirty London or something. And it was all about like, you know, the fact that people didn't shower and that clothes didn't get washed. And there was a lot of, you know, illness and things like that. Um, so what's like the grossest thing you've learned in your research? Oh, I don't, well, okay. it's not, but, yeah, go ahead, Susan. Go ahead. I, I, that's another thing I think of as sort of a myth. And that I don't think people in my time period, I'm, you know, 18, late 18th century, I don't think that average people were dirty. I don't, they did not take baths and that they didn't do full immersion bathtubs and they didn't take showers, but they washed, um, they did what amount to sponge bath every day. They changed their linen, which is their undergarments. Sometimes if you were a wealthy person, you would do it a couple of times a day during hot weather. So they were they were clean. They just not clean by our standards. Mm. Um, it's the same thing that if you tell somebody now, uh, if you tell a teenager now who washes her hair twice a day, you know, always wants a perfect blowout that, you know, in the 1960s, people only washed their hair once a week, they would be horrified. Mm -hmm. So it's just different different standards. I guess so. You can now tell a gross a gross story. I mean, there is things like um, there is no indoor plumbing. There's chamber pots, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You can't get around that. Well, you always read about like the servants would dump the chamber pots off the window, kind of thing, and people could get, you know, stuff. I don't know. Like it, it just sounds really interesting and different. <laughs> well, it would be a different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you're just walking along and you get hit by like you know, something. Yeah, I, I wonder how much they actually did that. I would think they probably took the pots out and dumped them in the privy instead of just drop, dumping them in the street. And it also then too would be in what neighborhood you were. Yes. Too. Thank you. Thank you for blowing that out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say that. Um, like so many readers, we probably learned so much from your books, you know, like our history. Like I know I've traveled it and been like, oh, that's something I learned about in, you know, a Loretta Chase book or something. And some people will be like, oh, you know so much. And I was like, yeah, I read romance. <laughs> but that's okay. And and I think that that for most people, I mean, I take that as a responsibility of why I have to, I have to be good with my research and not write stupid things like men wearing silk shirts and a four poster bed on a sailing ship. We, I mean, you know, I'm not going to do that because for most of the majority of the people who read my books, that's where they're getting, they're going to get their history. And I sort of feel it's a, my responsibility, both to my readers and to the people I'm writing about the historical figures to get it as right as possible and not go completely off the rails um you know i'm not presenting it as a total fantasy thing and i want to make it as accurate as i can i'm not am i going to get it always right no but i can try <laughs> <laughs> all right loretta hit us with that grossest thing you've ever researched yeah, loretta will have something gross well <laughs> the grossest thing for me is was medical care um oh. yeah and um it's, but I'm not sure even how gross it is. It was like, yeah, they use leeches and yeah, there was a lot of bleeding and um, they just had a very different understand, grasp of the way illness worked. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, I think the grossest discovery for me was what cholera was like, because I didn't know. And 1832, which is right smack in my, uh, the era that I've been working in, it was when the cholera uh, came to uh, Scotland and then England. 
And I had no idea until I started doing the research. And then I realized, well, I can't really talk about cholera in my books because they're romances Mm -hmm. and people are just going to get grossed out. So I didn't. But uh, yeah, I can't really think of anything else that's like particularly, maybe I'm inured. (laughs) <laughs> but it's true. The medical stuff just seems so awful and it seems yeah. so barbaric. And then you, then you think of some of the things, some of the treatments that people go through now and it yeah. sounds like cancer treatment. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. or some of the things that the, the treatments that they're doing for um, the people with severe COVID and things. I mean, that just sounds awful. So I, I think medicine always has that, <laughs> that aspect. <laughs> yeah. It's all in the perspective, right? Yeah. Um, so what actually this brings me to a question that Emily has too that um, when you're doing your research for your books at what point do you realize that you have to maybe make something up and how do you um, how do you resolve that in your story so that the reader under might or might not know that that's true or not true uh, I do um, afterwards where I try and explain what is what is made up and what isn't um, because it just, I, I feel you sort of have to do that. Uh, as I said, the secret wife of Aaron Burr, I had almost nothing to go with. And I say that, I mean, there's all, there's like three things that they know about this woman and that's it. And it, so the whole, the other 700 pages is made up. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's sort of the way I treat it anyway. I think people coming to romance, I hope, understand it's Romance Landia and there weren't 10,000 Dukes um but they don't necessarily what i do is if i steal stuff from the 1800s like if i steal um the wording of something i put that in the back of the book and um uh, some event because i try to ground my stories in events that actually happened when i when i make something up then i have to i feel as though i have to explain that at the end of the book so i do what susan does just differently Everybody afterwards. read that. Read it. We put a lot of effort into those. Those are like our, our summation, our essays at the end to tell, yeah. to tell what happened. Yeah. I think that was very important because um, it does give you a sense of like, wh- you know, where the, div- div- the divergence is. And that makes you wonder like what, what made you make that part up as opposed to using real historical fact? Um, you know, is it a plot point? Is it because there wasn't a setting like that or, you know, thing, you know, things like that as a reader yeah. that's a right I'm you know I, I make up I make up a newspaper that I've been using in several books mm-hmm. and it's based on a few magazines that were in existence at the time so I my readers know that that's didn't exist because I tell them the stuff that I stole from the court journal or I stole from so-and-so <laughs> I mean I'm pretty open about um about those things your thievery yes about my thievery okay but again it's like it's, it's inspiration an, it's, <laughs> well, it's an interesting thing with romance because on the one hand it's an idealized world so the, the reality you have to be a little bit careful with it because you don't want to turn readers off you can't get too bogged down in in the world that as as it actually existed or as we understand it but on the other hand i don't want to get too far off into a fantasy land that doesn't have any grounding in the real world that as i understand it mm-hmm. so it's always a balance i think and i think there's so many different kinds of writers and so many different kinds of books that readers can find what level of fantasy or reality how gritty do you want your book yeah how real do you want your book um which is great and that's one of the 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 nice things about how many books there are all the different writers out there we all we all could tell the same story but it all be different yeah (laughs) exactly and that's exciting for us readers because we always know that no two books are going to be the same unless they're plagiarized of course um (laughs) so margaret asks susan Will you ever return to the 17th century? Do you think um, in US or Europe, are you most likely to remain in the 18th century colonial America? Because she's looking forward to Martha and she's looking forward to Martha. Well, that's good. (laughs) Well, for now, I think I will probably stay put. 
but uh, yeah, who knows? I really enjoyed doing Restoration in England in the 17th century because that's such a wild time period. Um, but I think you all also go where the where the readers want to go, mm -hmm. and what the, where the publishers will buy. And right now, again, thank you, Lynn Manuel. 18th <laughs> century, late 18th century America is 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 something people are interested in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you all, um, Emily asks, read history for fun or just for work purposes? I read more history than I, I, but I don't read as fiction. I almost never read fiction now. I used to read it all the time, but now it, I can't get, I can't like lose myself in a lot of books. I, I start looking, trying to analyze it and figure out, well, where's it going on? So I don't, it isn't as much fun. So I read mostly nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Loretta? I I do both. I read tons of fiction. I love detective stories, so that's my most of my fiction writing reading. But I um I do like to read history books, and I periodically, at least once a year, I I, I read a tome, something that has to be about six inches thick, <laughs> and just lose myself in that. Well, that's one of the things that the the you know things that Loretta and I realized that we were really sisters separated at birth was we both love Anthony Trollope. <laughs> <laughs> which is like nobody ever says that yeah. <laughs> but yeah which which one of the chronicles of Barset did you like best so yes <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine some of your conversations yeah. Um, so, yeah so we're almost out of time I just have one last question and that is um what is the if you can your favorite thing that you've ever discovered in um in your research travels I don't know. Uh, that would be I would that would be hard to well, one of them. Okay. There's, there's, okay, you go. I'll go <laughs> with I one. I don't know. How I mean, I have it. a lot. I have many favorites. So we'll, we'll go. This isn't like the favorite, but it's one of them. Uh, discovering Giovanni Belzoni uh, when I was writing Mr. Impossible. It was so he was just so fascinating to me. His wife was so fascinating. His whole life was like something that you would read in some kind of, you know, buccaneering fiction, but it was his real life. So, I mean, he was just a treat. Um, so that was one of, that was my thing. That was one of my really fun discoveries. Mm -hmm. Now I have to think of something. <laughs> um, okay, one of the things I really enjoyed in discovering about Eliza Hamilton is that the one portrait of her that you always see where she's got powdered hair and she, she's probably in her, I think she's late 20s, early 30s, and it's the, the, the paint portrait you always see, was painted in a jail, that the artist was in debtor's prison, and he had no paints, he'd sold his paints, he had nothing. And Alexander Hamilton, obviously Eliza's wife, felt sorry for him and knew he was a great painter and wanted to give him a break. So he had um, he commissioned him to paint Eliza's portrait. Eliza went had to go to the, the New York City jail and sat there um, while she had her portrait painted. And then that that he earned enough money and other women sort of saying, oh, it's a beautiful portrait that he was able to get out of debt. And come to it but I love the idea of oh that's so cool Eliza all dressed up in her white satin her hair all done going to sit in a room at the New York City jail <laughs> so that's excellent isn't that a good story yeah yeah that would be one of my favorites too although I don't do the deep research you do so I don't know what else I would have discovered well <laughs> I I'd, I'd found, come across that story and I kept trying to see the painting and it was always on loan somewhere else it's at the it belongs to the Museum of the City of New York I think and it was never there. It was always on the road somewhere. And I was at um, the Museum of the American Revolution in Yorktown. And there was just some other exhibition. And I turned the corner and there it was. And I was with somebody else. I was like, oh, oh it's a it's a <laughs> So yeah, we get excited. <laughs> so somebody, I saw one of the little things coming on the bottom asked about what I'm wearing. I mean, yes. somebody asked. Um, I don't know if I can get close enough. There he is. Wait, I'll do it. It's a, uh, a 1780s miniature by, who is he? John Donaldson, I think. 
And if I can get him off, because he's very cute. Let's see if we can get him up on the, see how cute he is? Oh yeah. <laughs> With his, his big poofy hair, but yeah. <laughs> did, where did you find that? Um, I, I don't remember, it came from a dealer or something. I have a, as Loretta, Loretta buys hand tinted magazines, 1830s, complete sets of 1830s magazines. And I like little miniatures. So we, we have our vices. <laughs> well, in the world of vices, I was really so bad. <laughs> well, they're very, they're very nice. Oh, it even, I forgot to say it has his hair on the back too. Huh? Ooh, Which real is hair, his real hair. hair. Wow. Like Elvis, <laughs> we can have people like on eBay. The hair people. thing, the hair stuff is real big back then. People do lots of hair. You know, you exchange locks of hair with your, you know, your bestie and your children. Everything was woven and made into jewelry and stuff. And that, oh, that was a weird, exciting thing was seeing Alexander Hamilton's hair, which is in, yeah. there's, there's a lot of it around in different collections. Mm -hmm. Anyway. How do you authenticate something like that? I have no idea. I the most of the ones, and we're getting off on a weird thing now. But <laughs> most of the time, when people, uh, famous people, when they would die, their widows would take cut off their widows or widowers would cut off locks of their hair, which would then be made into mourning jewelry um, or given as mementos to close friends or to famous, you know, to to other other people who asked, could I have some of the famous hair? So like there's strands of George Washington's hair all over the place in all different collections. And who knows if that's all real? I don't think the poor man probably didn't have enough hair to do all that. But um, it's somehow it's, it's sort of creepy, but cool at the same time that that part of a person is still alive. So I think it would be super cool if we did a Jurassic Park type of thing with the founding and Bring fathers. them back. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so interesting. <laughs> And it, the founding it, it mothers, really of would. course. We don't want to leave them out. We don't want to let them out? We don't want to leave out the founding mothers. We want to like Jurassic Park them all. All of them. All um, of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, would be, it, would, it would be very strange. <laughs> it would be pretty strange for them. Yeah, they would not be. I think that a lot of them would be sort of horrified by the way things are going now. But hey, <laughs> we're not going to go there. But they yeah. would just—they would be surprised. We'll just let it go with that. <laughs> well, remember in Jurassic Park, it wasn't the actual people; it was clones of them. So, it wouldn't actually be them. It would. Just oh, so they would. There, there. They can still keep. Yeah. Keep being at peace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, on that note, <laughs> we're getting weirder and weirder now, aren't we? Yes. we which we expected. So it's awesome. Um, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for reuniting for this amazing, wonderful discussion. Um, I'm going to um, just say that I would love to do this again sometime. You know, a lot of your fans here would probably be joining us again, but this has been fascinating. And I feel like I've learned a lot, not just about you, like your process, but like where to find information and um, how to keep yourselves out of the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> We love the so, rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I mean, there's a reason for it, you know, because it just gets more and more fascinating, right? Yes. So that's where you get stuck. Yeah. But well, I thank really you so do. Thank you for having us. Yes, oh. thank you. It was a, what a great opportunity to talk about nerdy history stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is so much more to talk about. And I, I'm, I'm sorry we have to end as, as we are, but I do appreciate your time and your thoughts. And, um, all of the work that you've put into keeping us entertained and educated over the years. So thank you. Thanks. Mina. Thank you. You're welcome. So thank you attendees. Again, I put the link for um, buying signed books from bank score books in the chat. Feel free to order anytime. And um, thank you for being here. I will send out a recap with a video link and all of that. And um, I hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks for joining us today. So I'm going to stop the live stream and